of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome, and let the role reflect that all of the council members are present and a quorum has been established. Tonight we have a presentation by Dakota County and Commissioner Mike Slavic. We'll um, welcome him. There we go. Welcome, Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Council Members, and City Staff. Uh, it is uh, great to be here today. Um, I'm here before you uh, actually to introduce a county staff, or one of our county assessors. Uh, it, some of you may recall in December when I gave my county update, there was some questions uh, regarding um, assessed values and kind of the, what the process looks like, and particularly uh, what uh, what the city of Hastings, the community of Hastings looks like with those numbers. So uh, today I did bring uh, with me uh, county staff, uh, Joel Miller, who, who is the uh, deputy uh, director of the uh, assessing office with Dakota County Residential Division. And he's gonna go through a presentation here and then certainly open for questions after. Great, so thank you, you, Mike. Thank you, commissioner. Thank you, mayor, council members for having me here tonight. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Joel Miller. I'm the uh, Deputy Director of Assessing Services, and I also manage the residential section of the department. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to make this presentation tonight to uh, provide a little information on the 2023 assessment that will be used for the basis of property taxes in 2024. A uh, couple of quick background items here. We are required to assess all property as of January 2nd every year. So January 2nd, 2023 was the date of value for the 2023 market values used for taxes payable in 2024. Uh, state law does require that we assess at market value um, for all property types, um, and market value is the price that would prevail, prevail in competitive market conditions, uh, essentially arm's length transactions uh, are what we're looking at when we evaluate the sales. Uh, starting on March 10th, we mailed out about 160,000 uh, uh, tax statements and included with that was the 2023 uh, notice of market value. Um, about 8,200 of those were to properties in Hastings. Uh, the Minnesota Department of Revenue is the agency that oversees all assessor's offices in the state, uh, both to make sure we're in compliance with all relevant statutes and also to monitor the quality of our assessments. Uh, the biggest, sale, the biggest uh, tool they use for that is their sales ratio study. Uh, they look at sales between October 1st of 2021 and September 30th of 2022 is the relevant period of sales that they look at for the 2023 market value. Uh, basically, we in our office also look at those same sales. We review those sales. We uh, verify them. Um, if need be, we call owners if we have to find out more about the transaction and then we analyze them all uh, using mass appraisal methods. Uh, we're required to maintain a level of assessment between 90 and 105 percent on all property types. Um, and for 2023, uh, we did meet that requirement on all property levels. Um, and preliminarily, uh, we've heard from the Department of Revenue that uh, the state board, they're, they're ordering no changes to our assessment, which is, I believe, the 29th year now that we can say that. So. A little bit about valuation methodology. As mentioned, we assess as of January 2nd using our computer-assisted mass appraisal system. We have all properties throughout the county and throughout the individual cities assigned to individual neighborhoods. Uh, basically, these neighborhoods are made up of similar property types and also within like the residential single-family uh, properties of similar property characteristics so that we can analyze these sales down uh, to a neighborhood level. Uh, for 2023, we had uh, just over 6,600 uh, valid sales countywide. About 400 of those were in Hastings. Uh, changes in market value countywide. The estimated market value uh, this year is up to 73.71 billion, and the taxable market value is 72.40 billion. Uh, the biggest difference in those numbers being the uh, uh, homestead market value exclusion. Um, some other programs like Green Acres uh, uh, also play into that. 
Uh, we had uh, about 1.169 billion of new construction, and that resulted, that new construction resulted in about 14.28 million of additional tax capacity. Here's a comparison from 23 to 24. Uh, this kind of illustrates the shift that occurred from the large increases in residential values last year. Uh, you can see that uh, for tax base for 2023, residential properties made up 67% of the total uh, tax base. And this year for taxes payable in 2024, that number has dropped to 65% of the total tax base. So the big increase last year is uh, going back at least partially for next year. Uh, in the city of Hastings, it's a similar trend, although your residential tax base is a little bit bigger percentage of the total pie uh, than the countywide numbers. Uh, but similarly, you're seeing uh, the portion of the residential tax capacity uh, decrease from 7634 to a projected number of 74.77 for the 2023 assessment for taxes payable next year. Uh, this chart just kind of illustrates the same thing, but you can see the various property types and how they, they fluctuated last year. Um, uh, residential actually saw about a 3.58% increase in their total piece of the pie last year compared to the other property types this year. They're actually seeing a 2% decrease compared to the other property types. Um, you probably all are well aware of what happened with values last year. Um, we saw all of our big cities were in that 17, 18% range. Um, you guys actually led the way for single value property in the cities at 21% uh, for a median increase last year. Uh, this year, uh, fortunately I'll get to in a minute, that's going to be a little bit better. <laughs> um, oops, I skipped. I hit something here and skipped ahead a little bit. Uh, uh, this year the big winner was um, industrial and apartment. It saw uh, value increases quite a bit bigger than, than what the residential market saw. So a little bit of information on value changes. Um, countywide, the median change on single family properties this year is 3.2%. Uh, last year that was just over 17%. Uh, Hastings is 2.63%, and as I just mentioned last year, that was 21%. Uh, the range for within the cities uh, was just over 1% to just under 8%, uh, with a few townships, again, in, uh, up in the, into the low teens. Uh, just breaking that down, uh, residential single family is definitely the largest part of that sector. Uh, so that's going to be ultimately what the countywide totals were. But breaking that down a little further, townhouse had a countywide median change of 2.77%. Hastings was about 5%. A condo was a 3.28% countywide, and Hastings had about an 8% increase in condos. Uh, here's a graph that just kind of illustrates the the amount of properties that changed how much. Uh, the dark blue indicates the estimated market value. The light blue um, is the taxable market value. You can see that peak right around 3 4% there. Um, Hastings would be on the lower side of that peak. Um, and again, the taxable market value increasing at a little bit greater rate than the, the estimated market value because the rolling off of the market value homestead exclusion, uh, which as values go up, that uh, exclusion gets lower. This is just a little chart I prepared um, uh, based on, um, I had the question of how did that play out over the course of the year. So what I did is essentially a, a, a ratio study per month uh, just to see how much the values changed on a monthly basis. And we saw through the spring last year the market was still pretty hot um, all the way up through May where it kind of peaked and then actually uh, started to trickle down a little bit um, but still resulting in a net net effect of being up overall, uh, kind of corresponding right along with the interest rate changes too. And so if we saw the interest rates starting to change, the market really started to slow down. A uh, little bit of information on some of the other property types. Uh, commercial countywide median was 9.55%. Uh, Hastings median was 8.79%. Uh, Industrial was the big winner this year. Uh, that's kind of last year's residential property uh, a title, um, they saw a median increase of over 20% this year. Um, Hastings has a pretty small industrial base, but their um, median change was uh, still over 18%. And apartments countywide saw a median change of 6.44%. Hastings saw actually over 16%, but 
in speaking with the commercial manager about this, he kind of cautioned me to kind of take that with a grain of salt because countywide values change similarly, but the smaller properties saw bigger increases than the larger properties. This year in Hastings just has a bigger mix of smaller apartment properties. So uh, it kind of makes it look like that number was bigger than other areas, but it's only because of the mix of properties that it's that high. Um, agriculture, not a lot of agricultural in Hastings, uh, but this year what we did see was uh, some of the highest increases I recall ever getting from the Department of Revenue for green acres values. Um, they initially um, gave us an increase of about 26% in our green acres values. Uh, we did appeal that and it ended up dropping it down to 21%. So um, that affects uh, certainly the, the townships a lot more than the city here. Uh, we use a little bit different valuation method on, on our ag land within the cities because of a different highest and best use on it. So ultimately your, your ag land has got to estimate a value much higher than a lot of the townships to, to start with. And here's just a little table that just shows we're not alone in that. The, the, these are the, uh, the rates from the Department of Revenue for some of the other um, counties around us. Um, and they were all up in that upper teens to low 20s for the green acres rates this year. Um, some appeal stats. Uh, for 2023 so far, um, we have had, uh, this is as of last week when I pulled these numbers, uh, we had uh, 674 uh, people contact our, our office about their assessed values. Uh, 34 of those were from Hastings. Those numbers would be a little bit higher if we re-ran them today. But comparing to that same time period for the past two years, uh, last year at this time we, we were already over 1,000 appeals, uh, 54 of which were from Hastings. And countywide, the year before that, we were at 429 appeals, 17 from Hastings. So we are definitely down from last year, uh, but still up from two years ago. Um, and just a little uh, kind of information for you. Uh, last year of um, close to 1,700 appeals uh, for the 2022 market value, 459 ended up getting a value reduction after we reviewed the property, which amounted to about 28%. Uh, some appeal methods. Um, first of all, we always encourage people to go out to our website. We've got a lot of property information on there. Uh, they can find information on sales that have occurred. They can review their own property just to verify all of their property characteristics are accurate. Um, it may be that they go out there and, and see that we have 800 square feet of their basement finished and they say, well, I only have 600. Well, we'll go out there and take a look at that, get that corrected. Whatever happens to the value, we'll send them a new notice, um, get that taken care of for them. Um, if, if they want to uh, uh, appeal further, you can uh, go to our website and request an online appeal. We have a new appeal form that we developed last year uh, that has gotten pretty good reception that they have the ability to just fill out a few fields. They can attach any documents if they have an appraisal or a market analysis or something they want to submit. Um, pick their preferred method of contact, uh, send that in. That all gets uploaded right into our system, so it's a, it's a good way for us to to track those appeals and also get some information from them on the front end so that it's not end up being multiple calls, you know, to, to discuss the property with them. So I think it's worked out well for both us and the taxpayers. And of course, they can always just call our office um, or stop in at our front desk and, and ask to talk to someone about that. Here's just a little screenshot of the appeal form. Um, they've made some good enhancements to it. It's pretty user-friendly and easy to fill out. And like I said, it allows them to provide an explanation and any supporting documents they might have. And then here is a, a screenshot of the, the uh, value notice that we send out. Um, it's got information about all the appeal options on there. It has information if your appeal is not resolved satisfactorily. They have the uh, uh, option to appeal before the Special County Board of Appeal and Equalization. Um, and we ask them to call us by May 1st, but that's not necessarily a hard deadline. If they call us after May 1st and uh, you know, it's someone we've been dealing with, we're still gonna allow them to, to sign up for that meeting. Uh, it just helps us if we do know how many people are gonna attend that we can set the agenda and notify the board members you know, how long we think the meeting's gonna go and stuff like that. So, um, and then as a last resort, they always have the option to appeal beyond that by filing a property tax petition uh, by April 30th of the payable year, I mean, they'd have until next year to file that on this year's assessed value. 
And so that's, with that, that's the end of my presentation, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. I know I went through all that fairly quick, but I didn't want to take up too much of your time either. So. Thank you, Joel. Council, any questions? Council Member Lund. Thank you, Renner. I, I just have a quick question. You may have had it on there, but do you know what the um, percent, the, the county average percent is for residential um, overall? So Hastings is 74%. What's the county average? Um, for the tax capacity, um, I believe it's about 10% lower. I can get you that exact number, but I, I believe it was roughly 60, 65% 65. Okay. Um, for residential properties and countywide and about 74% in Hastings. Thank you. So questions? the good news for the residential owners is a little bit of that tax shift last year because they had the big increases and everything else didn't go up as much. This year they're not going up as much as everything else, so some of that's going to, some of that burden is going to shift back to some of the other property types for next year. Joel, I have a question. So sure. all the developments that we're seeing built right now, I've had many people ask me, and I, I guess I have the same question, when when do we start to see those tax dollars that are being built now? At what point is it during this? Is it after the sale? Is it? it it's, it's as of January 2nd. So if that house had not started before January 2nd this year, it would not be until the 24 market value for taxes payable in 25. If that house was in process, what we have is a little checklist. We go out and say, yeah, this is 50% um, complete. So we'll add half the value this year and half the value next year. Okay. Great, thank you. Council Member Fox. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Miller, for being here. I think this is super helpful. I, I believe our, our residents and our, our constituents are really interested in this information, as we've seen in the past um, meetings that we've, we've talked about tax assessments. Um, I think it's important to recognize that the appeals process is not through the city. And I just wanna highlight that information a little louder, right? So um, if people are interested in this process, this is the assessments are not done through the city. And, and I think your presentation gave a really great highlight to that whole system, right? Absolutely. Um, that we are not, we are here to, to help understand the process, but, but the, the appeals process actually happens through the county. That's correct, yeah. If they, won't, if they have even, if they even just have questions, not even just to appeal their value, but if they have questions, they should absolutely contact our Excellent. office at, at the Dakota County Assessing Services and we'll explain it. Um, we may want to set up an appointment to go out and look at their property. Uh, sometimes just doing that, we might realize, well, this condition is below what we'd expect for this type of property. You know, it may be as simple as just doing an inspection sometimes. Um, if that doesn't satisfy them, they have the option to provide us with some sales information or an appraisal or whatever they might have. Um, if ultimately they're still unhappy, then they can appeal to the County Board of Equalization. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Commissioner Slavic, for um, being part of this conversation as well. Um, this is very helpful, and I know our constituents will really appreciate this information. Thank you. Any other discussion, Council? All right, again, thank you, Joel, and thank you, Commissioner Slavic. Great information, and further questions should be directed toward the county. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council You're members. welcome. Council members, are there any questions to the workshop or the council meeting for April 3rd? Okay. At this point, we will have comments from the audience. And for live comments, maybe either through Zoom link or in person, we ask that attendee either raise their hand on Zoom or step up, step up to the podium and present your name and address and with your concerns or your questions. Welcome. Good evening, Your Honor and the council members. My name is Pete Lakes. I live at 3000 East 4th Street in Hastings. As we all know, the water has arrived along the river and down in East Hastings. Last week, the governor was down here last week and whatever he looked at, he looked at the levee down here he went to Stillwood, he looked at the levee over there, and he provided, he provided comfort to the people or words of wisdom that he would do everything within his power basically to protect Stillwater, protect the riverfront Hastings. And I think it was yesterday, he said he's gonna add another three million or $3 billion to the flood prop to protect properties 
within the state of Minnesota around the horn for, for the flood thing, it, it's a good thing that he said that, okay? Because now I think that provides an opportunity for the city to step up and say, the question, there's, 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 two, there's two questions. Who controls the gate on the pathway out there at the Bauer farm when the water goes up? The city shuts the gate off so that, or the Bauer shut up, so that people don't transcend or transverse that, that path in high water when the Vermin River's up. Now, where we live down there, the state has, in, in, in the easement that I hold, that's been researched, I believe, by some of the city staff and some of the city council members, the question becomes, whose power supersedes who? If you can control the gate out there on the Bower, which on that Bower pathway along the Vermilion River, if you can say we're closing now because the water is going over, we're closing because a tree fell down, whatever we're doing, why can't, does the, does the city's powers within the city jurisdiction, does that supersede the state powers? I know the, the state owns that land, the DNR, the Corps of Engineers, whoever owns it, it doesn't matter. The, the, the question becomes, if you can control the gate out there, how come, you can't, how come we can't go back to the state and say, we want to control that pathway that goes through the woods down there that we're transversing? We're not opposed to, we understand, we're never going to build that lower road up. But in the same respect, for emergency purposes, I just sat here and tonight and I think I counted 21 people that reside down there. When, 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 we, when we signed that easement back in 1982 with the state of Minnesota, the, whoever was, there was only probably six or eight people living down there. We multiplied you know, almost fourfold. There's 24 people, 21 to 24 people can be down there at any given time. We're talking about less than a quarter of a mile of this path that they allowed us to use. We're allowed to put wood chips in there. I'd like to thank the city for providing us all. You bring them down, we'll put them through that path there. We'll make it happen. The question came up today, can the ambulance get through that pathway? If we cut some trees down, they'll come through. Then the next question, can we get a tanker in there? No, you can't get a tanker in there right now. Back in 1982, when Ron and Nancy Shanley built their house down there, the water went over the lower road, and the Maher Well Company lost the well drilling rig because they couldn't get a fire truck through that pasture. Maher's lost up half a million dollars in a, far, in, a, in a rig down that burnt from the top right down to the ground. So the question becomes, we live down there, we accept, we accept the responsibility that we live down there, we, choose, we chose to live down there, more people have come down there. But if the governor can say, well, we're gonna throw eight million into the flood fund, why can't, the, why, can't the, why can't the city go back to the governor and say, let's look, at, let's look at this easement, let's come in the back door if we have to. <laughs> Open up that easement, it says Pete Lakes, Diane Lakes, Bob and Judy Wittenbull, and Nancy Missick. That's what it says on that easement. But in that easement that was signed up the Dakota County Courthouse in 1982, now we got 21 people, six houses down there. Who's liable? The state, the city, the county? Number one, the city is collecting taxes, they're providing service, the county is collecting taxes, and the state's collecting taxes on the properties down there, but yet they have this, they have this fine line. We don't know if we can put gravel on that. A quarter of a mile, <laughs> nobody goes over, then you can control, you control like, like, the, like the walkway out there at Bowerville, you could control that down there, put a gate on each end of it. it it's only open during high water. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Pete. Good evening, Mayor. My name is Ray Kane, City Council members. Most of you guys know me as Ray, the Beyond the Yellow Ribbon President for uh, Mississippi River Valley. Um, we cover Cottage Grove, Hastings, and St. Paul Park in Newport. Um, so I know a lot of you guys and been speaking up here once or twice, but I'm here for a different reason. I'm here because we want to talk about Chapter 34.3, um, the, the code and the amendment that you guys have. Um, I'm also the gambling manager for St. Paul Park Newport Lions Club, and I'm a member of the um, Hastings Legion um, in, here in the, the Hastings city here, and it's a great legion. We're going to talk about gambling. Currently right now, I don't know if you guys know, but we're fighting with the Senate and with the House about um, deductions and taxes right now 
and them eliminating some of our gambling stuff. So currently right now they want to take e-tabs away or they're going to take some of the features away that is going to dramatically decrease, actually devastate some of our revenue coming in to our charitable organization, especially the American Legion. We're having a, a press conference tomorrow at the Senate and then we're trying to push for the tax deductions and keep more revenue. We're losing revenue in our, in our state, across the state of Minnesota. Um, and now with this code right here, and I don't know if you guys are aware of, the state of Minnesota is one of our largest donations that we give for charitable organizations. We donate 36% of our organization's taxes, or 36% of our organization's money that we get in go to taxes the state of Minnesota. We're fighting to get all that money back right now in the Senate. We have a press conference, we have a financial meeting tomorrow, and then this code right here that we see is additional 10% will come off our, our funds. So that's 46% of our charitable organization's revenue that we get is gonna be taken away from us. But not taken away from us, taken away from our ability to give to organizations within the cities. And in part of that, there's an increase from 50% to 75% of our donations that will stay in the city of Hastings. And for the American Legion, that's devastating. Um, once again, we take care of our veterans. There's several veterans programs out there that might not be a part of the city when we, when we talk about writing a donation to. So one is the Hastings Veterans Home. When writing a donation to the Veterans Hastings Home, you have to write the donation to Minnesota, Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs which does not qualify that as a donation to the residents here in Hastings. But that money in the memo can write down Hastings Veterans Home. So then those donations go to the Veterans Hastings Home. And I think if I'm correct, and Chris can, and Tom can correct me on this, but I think last year they gave around $10,000 to the Minnesota Veterans Hastings Home. And the Minnesota Veterans Assistance Fund, which I'm in charge of for the state of Minnesota, I'm also the um, Department Service Officer for the American Legion Department of Minnesota. We have a veterans assistance fund and a veteran that's in need and want to lift them up and give them money to sustain. We pay house payments, car payments and that stuff. And I looked it up and currently right now we've given $15,000 to Hastings residents. So based on confidentiality with veterans and stuff like that, we don't announce that, but we give a lot of money to the city of Hastings, but just in a different way because that check is written out to the American Legion foundation and the memo line fund 85 which we will not get credit for in the city of Hastings. So once again, there's that donation that's coming back to the Hastings, but we're not receiving that. A part of Yellow Ribbon is a lot of the donations get put to Cottage Grove beyond the Yellow Ribbon, but even though we're Mississippi River Valley, that donations won't count. And I can tell you right now, we just gave, I just wrote a check out for $1,000 to a veteran here in Hastings that is currently deployed and we're, we're mowing their lawn and stuff like that. Um, if you, Mary, Mayor, Mayor, you know that we've been in here quite a bit. We've mowed lawns, we fixed a, a gentleman's fence, a car. Um, I can go on and on about what we've done in Hastings. But once again, those donations from the American Legion and other organizations won't get credit for that because it's not here in the city of Hastings. So the, the money that we get is throughout the other organizations. And if we go from 50 to 75%, then other parts of our, our veterans community are gonna suffer from that. The American Legion in Hastings gives money to the VA hospital, and they do great things with that money. We're just working on a polytrauma unit, one of the best polytrauma units in the United States. Um, it's gonna be just a huge thing that this VA hospital in Minneapolis is gonna take care of. But, once again, it's a veterans organization giving to veterans but we're not gonna get credit here in the state, city of Hastings. That's gonna affect our donation and what we do for veterans. Even though it's not a donation to the Hastings, you have a large veterans community here. And that money that's gonna to go to the Hastings home is gone through the state. And also the VA hospital, you have a lot of residents that use that hospital. And that's gonna be a part of those donations. We, do, we use transportation for individuals in Hastings to, to the DAV that come down here and pick up veterans to go to the Hastings uh, or go to the Minneapolis Veterans uh, Hospital. We can't do that anymore. So that's something that we wanna really look at is when you're looking at increasing 50% of the donation to 
there's a lot of organizations that you have in the town that it's not going to affect because they use the donations like the athletic associations. That money stays in Hastings. But with American Legion, we have four pillars, and those four pillars is community. One of them is community and, and involvement. And our last thing as our preamble that we say at every meeting is mutual, mutual helpfulness. That's going to affect our mutual helpfulness here in the city, of Minnesota, the city of Hastings. But not only that, across the state of Minnesota. The, the, currently, that Minnesota Veterans Fund that they, Hastings uh, Legion gives, we take care of a lot of veterans in our community across the state. Homelessness, giving them a place to stay for the night. Some of those funds, once again, were used to make sure a veteran in Hastings had a place to stay when it was a coldest winter and we got them services through Dakota County Veteran Services. So it was a temporary fix, but once again, that money was not coming from the Hastings community. It was coming from the American Legion Department of Minnesota and other Legion members. This fund that I, I generate is gambling money throughout the whole state of Minnesota. And once again, that's used for residents in Hastings, but not generated and won't qualify right now with this reading, if I'm reading it correctly, with this amendment that you're gonna pass through the state of Minnesota. Now, once again, we are taxed, beyond taxed on, on gambling. Then add another 10% to taxes on our 40, that's 46% of our donations currently gonna go to taxes. Right now, if we ran the numbers, after taxes, after buying games, funding e-tabs and all that, only 3% of our money goes to charitable organizations. Now, if we do additional 10%, that's gonna go down to two to 1%. And that's not what we want. We wanna make sure that our money stays in the veterans' hands and in the community. And we understand, we support a lot in our community right now. We do a lot here, but to increase that to 75%, that's gonna devastate programs. And right now, if this current bill passes in the Senate, it's gonna be devastating for programs here in, the, in your, your, your city. You're gonna lose programs. You're gonna lose food shelves and places like that. Um, school donations are gonna go down when people say, hey Ray, you know, Tom, the new gambling manager here, they say we need helmets for the football team because there's a new safety feature. They come to the, the Hastings veterans here in the Legion. We won't be able to write those big checks when they need safety programs or another scoreboard or safety equipment for the baseball team or the football team, we won't be able to provide that, not only because we're taxed at 36%, but we had to have an additional tax being added on. So I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kane. Hi everybody, I'm Afton Benson. I'm with Climb Theater. We're in Invergrove Heights, Minnesota. I'm going to echo a bunch of the things you just heard um, about charitable gambling. So none of you know me, I'm sure. Anywho, I'm the CEO and Managing Director of Climb Theater. And Climb Theater is, mission is to inspire and propel people towards acts that benefit themselves, each other, and their community. And one of the communities that we do charitable gambling in is Hastings. We're at Pub 55 and at the Bar Hastings. And currently, we are doing a residency program at Hastings Middle School. It's a first one, it's a pilot program with them, so we're completely customizing the program to that school to make sure we meet the needs of those kids. A 75% trade area is crippling, to say the least. Um, I will echo the exact same thing. We are one of the highest taxed operations in the state of Minnesota. Um, Climb Theater, we calculated when uh, all of the gambling stopped, 1% of the state's revenue from taxes came from our organization alone. That's a lot. And so taking extra funds away from kids in your community and kids in the state of Minnesota is really heartbreaking for us and for the schools. Just to give you a little bit of information about what we've been doing, we've been doing charitable gaming in Hastings for over 10 years. Um, I didn't have a uh, time to go pull our lease agreements to get the exact date, but it's been over 10 years, which is a long time. And in the last year, we have contributed $30,000 to Hastings schools. 
if this passes, we are going to have to reconsider doing any gambling in the city of Hastings, which would mean that seven of our employees will potentially lose their jobs or the amount of hours that they have. And around 1,300 Hastings students a year will not get programming to help them continue to propel themselves and the community of Hastings towards really great acts. Um, I did send a video link, but I called and they weren't sure if they could play it or what. So you have it in your email. But there's a kindergarten teacher from Kennedy Elementary who we worked here with for a couple of years, actually. And she stated in this really amazing video that Kennedy Elementary made about Climb Theater and the program that we're doing there, <coughs> that they're so fortunate to have Climb Theater join their school in her classroom. They do a wonderful job of keeping kids engaged and giving them practical solutions for solving big problems. We've been working with her for over five years in her position, which is a pretty long time for a kindergarten teacher, um, especially given the certain climate. So I'm, I'm strongly urging all of you to not change what you have going here. Um, and again, echoing all of, all of the sentiments that they have expressed as well. Climb throughout Minnesota additionally supports variety of organizations. We do summer safety camps. We teach kids about cybersecurity. We teach them financial literacy. We do aquatic invasive species programming. You name it, we do it, and we've been everywhere. And we've been everywhere for 47 years. We'd like to continue to be a staple in Hastings and continue working with the schools. Uh, and in order to do that, we need to still be able to pay our staff, which is what the rest of everything else goes for. So anyway, thanks to Bundle. Thank you, Ms. Benson. Anyone else wish to speak to the council at this time? Okay. Okay. Council items, are there any items to be considered? Council members. Council, I would accept a motion to approve the consent agenda. So Council member Pemble. Council member Lund. All those in favor of the motion to, oh, discussion? I'd like to uh, poll number six, please. Polling number six of the consent agenda which is the first reading of the City Code Amendment Chapter 110, 17 and 34-.03, Lawful Gaming and Fees. Moving forward, we'll put that under administration, uh, except the consent agenda, removing number six. Council Member Fox, second. A discussion on the consent agenda council. Okay, all those in favor of the motion state by saying aye. Aye. Opposed to that motion, state by saying nay. Okay. Tonight we have a public hearing for a new par parklet application for quarry tap room, or tap house, I'm sorry. For this item we will have an introduction by Community Development Director John Hinsman, followed by a public hearing and potential action by City Council. Welcome, John. Thank you, Mayor, City Council members. As the Mayor pointed out, two actions for you tonight. One, to hold a public hearing. The second, to consider application and approval of the parklet. So we're looking at the parklet that is located here at 106 2nd Street East for the quarry. You may recall that in previous years, there was a similar parklet from a different operator at this location. And in fact, the parklet itself is identical to what was there previously. Because there is a new ownership group involved within this proposal, there is a new application necessary for it. Uh, with the public hearing itself, we have notified those within 350 feet of the property, have not heard any comment back at this time. During the review of the parklet and its operations, we reviewed it through various city departments and we are recommending approval of its issuance here. So if you'd like at this time, you may open the public hearing or I could stand for any questions you may have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. This time I will open the public hearing. Anyone here to wish to speak to the Cory Tap House parklet? No one on Zoom. At this time I will close the public hearing. Open discussion for council. Council members, any discussion? Council member Fulch. Your Honor, I'll make a motion to accept or to approve. 
approve the new parklet application from the board. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Fulch. And a second by Councilmember House. Discussion, Council? All those in favor of the motion, state by saying aye. 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 Opposed to that motion, state by saying nay. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, John. Tonight under city code amendments, escrows and fees, public hearing, we will have a, a public hearing and a second reading adoption for city code amendment chapter 34.03. B, a public hearing second reading adoption for city code amendment chapter 154 and C, a second reading and adoption city code amendment chapter 155. Thank you, Mayor City Council members. So a couple of different actions relating to similar portions of the city code tonight. They're pertaining to escrows and fees. And so as the mayor pointed out, public hearing on a couple sections of it, one of the public hearings and review of both these items we had before the planning commission. So what are we trying to do tonight? What we're doing is we're doing a couple of things. One is within the zoning and subdivision codes. There is specific fees that are cited within there that are also cited within the fee ordinance in chapter 34. We don't need them in both places, so we're deleting those sections from chapters 154 and 155. They remain in section 34. Uh, with the ultimate goal of this ordinance, with the escrows and with the, uh, the fee changes, we're trying to strengthen the language that we have within escrows. <laughs> escrows are taken for larger projects in which the ultimate time for review and expenditures for outside consultants for review of those projects is difficult to, to determine. And so what we do is we establish an escrow account. This is funds that's paid by the developer. And then uh, our cost, consultant costs in reviewing the application is deducted from this amount. And then any remaining funds is returned back to the developer after the end of it. So. Developments can change as far as the amount of time that goes into them. And so it's difficult to have just a simple application fee. The ultimate goal of this is that the development and uh, the developer should pay their own way in the review of the application. And so what we're doing with the escrow language is we're putting in certain, certain requirements of that you have to maintain a balance within there. If it goes below a certain amount, you have to replenishment, that it's not a one-time fee, that it is established for uh, the reimbursement of expenditures that we'd have over time. So we have that type of language going in there. The other thing that we're doing here is we're establishing a uniform escrow amount for all our applications, that being $5,000. And so right now there's varying sliding scales, which have been uh, confusing and, and difficult for us to manage. So we would be establishing a single escrow amount of $5,000. Again, this is an initial payment that would be paid if the project becomes more costly, additional funds would be necessary. If all the funds aren't necessary, the funds would be remitted back to the developer. So that's what we have before us tonight. We did have the Planning Commission review these uh, items at their uh, March meeting. They did recommend approval of it. The public hearing that we did hold at that time for the zoning code, we did not have anyone speak for or against that item. So before you tonight, here are the public hearings for these. You can hold that at this time, or I can stand for any questions. Thank you. John. Since the public hearings are on related subject, let's hold them concurrently. We ask that the attendee either raise their hand um, on Zoom or end in person. And they will be invited to speak one at a time. This time I will open the public hearing. Anyone wish to speak at this time? No one on Zoom. Okay, at this time I will close the public hearing. Open discussion for City Council. Councilmember Lund. Make a motion to approve A, B, and C. Okay. Second, Your Honor. Thank you, Councilmember Lund and Councilmember Leifeld. New discussion or any discussion, Council? All those in favor of the motion state by saying aye. 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 Opposed to that motion state by saying nay. And that motion prevails. Tonight we have a resolution receiving bids and awarding contracts for Project 2023 and the Neighborhood Infrastructure Improvements. For this item, we have an introduction by Public Works Director Ryan Stemsky. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, we did receive eight bids for our 2023 Neighborhood Infrastructure Improvements, which is a great bidding environment for us in a volatile, volatile year. 
but I am pleased to say we, um, we did get a low uh, bid in the total amount of our contracted budget for 2023. So we were able to award um, or recommend award of the total base bid plus our bid alternate. And that is uh, our lowest bidder was BCM Construction. Uh, they passed all reviews. We actually, I actually worked with them in 2018 here and they did a wonderful job for us um, uh, meeting quality budget and schedule for the city of Hastings. So uh, we recommend BCM Construction for a total award of uh, $3,368,721.25. And with that, I'll take any questions or let the council act upon the resolution in your packets. Great, thank you, Ryan. Council Member Leifeld. Thank you, Your Honor. Ryan, this is all way over my head, so could you explain to me why, when you look at the bids, I see BCM obviously being the lowest bid, but when you go to their bid alternate number one, pretty much everybody else's alternate bid was higher. Was there any sort of miscommunication or something here that when I read what bid al alternate number one includes the modifications, I just want to confirm that that bid is accurate to what we were expecting. Right. Council Member Leifold, I, that's a great question. Um, bid alternate number one is a complicated part of the project. It's a, it's a bridge widening uh, for a pedestrian walkway on the west side of the bridge along Pleasant Drive. This was discussed with our bridge engineer and it was discussed with some of the bidders of why the difference in the numbers. I think it was a, a misunderstanding of some of the other bidders. There was certain subs that um, subcontracted to do the concrete work of the, the it, basically to us, it's a trail, concrete trail widening. Um, some of the, the subcontractors thought there'd be abutment and foundation adjustments to support all that analysis was done in the bid package. And really all this is is doweling into concrete and expanding the concrete of, uh, of the sidewalk out to 10 feet, which matches the trail, the, the multi-use trail that we're bringing down the west side. Excellent, thank you. So not only were they the lowest bid, but they understood the assignment, so. <laughs> Absolutely, you nailed it. <laughs> thank you, thanks Ryan. Thank you, Council Member Leifel. Any other discussion, Council Member Fox? Um, I move to adopt the resolution. Okay, with a second by Council Member Pemble. Additional new discussion, Council? All those in favor of the motion state by saying aye. 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 Opposed to that motion state by saying nay. And that motion prevails. Thanks, Ryan. We have a resolution to receive bids and awarding contract for the 2023 Mill and Overlay Project. You may continue, Ryan. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yes, so to continue with our, our good news in the bidding environment in 2023, we also on March 23rd opened up bids for our mill and overlay program. And we had five bidders for that particular project. Again, a good amount of bidders, a lot of familiar faces in that bidding group. But um, we also are able to recommend award of the base bid plus the alternate. The alternate here is just a, we always try to take the city's budget and push it as far as we can go, get as many streets as we can. But with volatile bituminous pricing, we had a couple segments we put in the alternate bid package so we could award if we had higher uh, pricing is kind of how we structured it, which makes our attorney happy when we do things very clear and, and, uh, and straightforward. Anyway, we were able to, we are able to recommend Park Construction Company as our lowest responsible bidder. And for the total amount of 723000 $626.75. And I do want to note this, this consumes all of the state aid budget, um, the uh, street budget, formula and overlay program. Plus we include in here some of our ADA compliance work. So we have 25 concrete sidewalk improvements and seven pedestrian ramp upgrades to comply with our ADA program. Um, and, and so there's, there's some small amount of dollars contributed to this project. We, we, we lump that together and bid it out in this environment to get the best prices to do as much work as possible. So with that, 
Uh, the resolution is in your packet and recommended for approval by staff. I'll Thank stand you, for any questions. Any questions, Council? No questions? I move to approve the resolution, Your Honor. Thank you, Councilmember <coughs> Fox. And a second by Councilmember Leifeld. Additional discussion, Council? All those in favor of the motion state by saying aye. 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 Opposed to that motion state by saying nay. And that motion prevails. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Under community development, we have a second reading and an adopt ordinance by City Code Amendment Chapter 155, Solar Energy System. And for this interjection, we are bringing back John Hensman. And thank you, Mayor, City Council members. Tonight, we're looking to establish a solar energy systems ordinance. And you may be asking, what exactly is that? I'll go through a little bit of an explanation as we go forward here. So we are looking to to have action as a second reading tonight. We had the first reading at your last city council meeting. Solar energy systems are what we look at here. They can be roof mounted, wall mounted, they can be panel systems, they can consist of something as small as, as something that could be a few feet uh, in area, all up to a, a solar farm, which can be ground mounted in a large area. Uh, the reason we are putting this together tonight is because we've had a request in the past for someone to open up a solar farm within the city and we did not have any regulations pertaining to it so we went together and looked at a few other ordinances and put one together uh, what this ordinance does is really establishes regulations for these type of facilities the ground mounted solar farms we have a lot of solar panels that come into the city as residential permits right now how those are regulated will not change much at all uh, they would come in they would be administratively controlled uh, through our building department. So within the code itself, we have a, a chart here which goes through how things are regulated. In a nutshell, if you've got something very small, less than six feet, no permit needed. You just put it on and do what you can. With the wall-mounted systems and the roof-mounted systems in residential districts, just need a building permit. We've added some regulations there on some performance standards, uh, which are pretty typical to what we have today. Uh, for roof-mounted solar gardens, uh, we require those to be on roof, on flat roofs with this. Again, just a building permit, no planning commission or, or council approval for that. Other performance standards related to glare and view from the public right-of-way. Also a decommissioning plan for when the, uh, the, the solar panels are done with their life stand. Uh, we have ground-mounted as an accessory use. So if we have a system like this and it's not located within a building or a structure, but as a structure on its own, uh, we do allow that if a property is over five acres. We're encouraging solar panels to be part of buildings, but if they're not part of buildings, they would need to be on a property of at least five acres. Uh, that would only require a building permit as well. Well, we get, in, we'll get into the nitty gritty here is on these ground mounted solar farms and gardens. These are our primary uses of land uh, that could take up many acres themselves, 5, 10, 20 acres or more. Uh, these are generally going to be agriculturally zoned, and in fact, within our code, they'd be required to be within the agricultural district. As you know, within the city of Hastings proper, there's not a lot of land zoned agriculture, so I don't know how much this would come into play, uh, but we did do want to uh, develop standards for those. So these would be allowed only within agricultural zones, and they would be by an interim use permit and site plan. An interim use permit is a permit with a specified time frame and length. It's similar to a, a special use permit in which the Planning Commission and City Council would review and set conditions. But in an interim use permit, a specific period of time would be established for its duration, and you could add uh, condition specifics to its operation. Items that we'd have in here would include uh, some setbacks, screening, buffering, underground electrical connections, stormwater management plan, and then a decommissioning plan when it's all done here. So that is what we're proposing within the ordinance amendments for solar energy systems. We did hold a public hearing and have planning commission review of this item at the March 27th meeting. Planning commission did recommend approval of it. Uh, we didn't have anyone come forward to speak for or against it during the public hearing. Some of the items that the Planning Commission suggested as changes we brought forward and as part of the amendment tonight. So I can stand for any questions on this. Great. Thank you. Thank you, John. Council, any questions? Councilmember Fulch. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Your Honor. John, I have two questions. Um, the first about the five-acre uh, requirement. You know, it's my understanding that Excel Energy isn't allowing new um, solar gardens to come into um, their grid, and they have to have like a maximum amount, maximum amount of like one, um, what is it, megawatt of energy, and so. Um, so, so the days of the ginormous, you know, solar arrays that you see in a few areas around here, like up on Cottage Grove on County Road 95 and such. Um, and so I'm just curious, I mean, I, I should have tried to look it up earlier, but, you know, is five acres too much of a requirement for, you know, if, if it's only one megawatt that they're allowed to build a solar array at this point? Just curious if you put those two together as to you know what's practical um, moving forward and so forth and so. Sure, yeah, we we do have that five acre minimum requirement in there. We looked at other city codes that had similar provisions and we we got that from there. I don't know if there's a, a rhyme or reason for a primary use on five acres. When we have a five acre minimum for an accessory use, this would be. You have a, a building on a property. Uh, the, the panels would not go on the building, but go on a separate structure. That one we, we set at five acres because we wanted to be able to encourage its development within the building and not have separate sites for it. But with the solar mounted garden, I, I don't have a, a real good, good rationale for that council member as to, as to why five acres was chosen other than we saw that within other, other codes. Okay. Hmm. When you take a look at the agricultural district, I should say as well, the agricultural minimum size is 10 acres. So we have a couple of, of properties out there that, uh, that may be less than 10 acres that are non-conforming at present, but uh, we do have a 10 acre minimum within our ag district. Okay, it is a small area. Um, I guess my second question then was in regards to historic buildings. Um, I was looking at, what is this? Section 4, paragraph E, historic structures, says solar energy systems on buildings within the designated historic districts or on locally designated historic buildings must be received, must receive approval by the Hastings Heritage Preservation Commission and shall be consistent with the standards for solar energy systems on historically designated buildings published by the U.S. Department of Labor. Oh, yeah, of interior, thank you, I put labor there. It's been a long day. So I was just curious, um, is there an actual name of the standard that just seems kind of general? You know, if I lived in one of those historic districts, I would want to know specifically, you know, what it is that you are referencing there. And I just get nervous because when I've done door knocking in the historic districts, they tell me of the very difficult circumstances that they've had to go through through the um, Heritage Preservation Commission and, uh, and how some things have been interpreted uh, by those who are on that committee and the difficulties it has been um, for them. And so I, I don't want to see... Um, a bar set so high that it makes it very difficult for folks who live in the historic districts, which are in Ward 1 and, and Ward 2, to be able to put solar arrays uh, on their homes. And so this just seems kind of general to me, you know, like you're referencing a standard that um, in general terms, and, it, and it's not specific as to so that people can actually know what it is that, that the, you know, that the guidelines are being held to. Do, do you understand what I'm making? I, I Am I making so, sense? Member. Like it should be a little bit more specific to, so that the reference is clear. Okay. Yeah, and, and council member, when, when we're looking at historic structures here and the role of the Heritage Preservation Commission, with the way the ordinance states it right now, it shall be consistent. It doesn't mean that it has to be to the letter. It means that when you take a look at these regulations that the Department of Interior puts forward, these should be reviewed and these should be considered by the Heritage Preservation Commission. It's not mandating a, a certain uh, adherence to specific standards, but more that they should be reviewed and they should be consistent, which provides them some uh, level of leeway in their review of the structure. <coughs> 
Okay, that still doesn't make me feel better. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just because, uh, you know, I, I, I'm trying to use my words um, cautiously, but, you know, I've been told that, you know, from homeowners, residents, that sometimes the standards that, as they're being interpreted um, by folks who govern that group, it's been very stringent. And so I would want it to be clear, you know, so that there's not... I'm afraid of <laughs> of, of um, gov the governing um, bodies that o are on that group to be too stringent. You know that oh goodness, that's a historic building. We can't possibly have a solar array on the top of it sure. because they didn't have solar arrays a hundred years ago, right? You know, I mean that's honestly what I'm afraid of. Well, that's not a historic, you know, uh, you know, material that was used on you know buildings, and 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 then then it would be, it would be stopped. Sure. So this gives me a lot of pause, just because I feel that people who live in the historic districts are already put through so much. Such they, they have to adhere to so much higher of a standard than other uh, residential homeowners do within our community as to what it is that they use to renovate you know their homes, the materials, the windows, the roofing, the siding, everything about it, and um, and then and then for them not to be adopt to be able to adopt new. Uh, technology, you know, as a part of their home, this really gives me a lot of pause. And I'm not sure how to make this better because you, you're saying that you, you wrote it so ambiguously as to allow more latitude, but I'm afraid of just of past performance and the many conversations that I've had with people in those areas that that may not be what happens. And, and Council Member, one aspect of the heritage preservation in their design review is that they, they do have the, the final authority with an asterisk next to it. If uh, an individual chooses to appeal the ruling of the Heritage Preservation Commission, then, then it come back to the city council. So if a, if a situation occurred in which a historic property felt that the decision of the HPC was an error, they could appeal it to the city council and the city council could take action on it at that point. So there's another safety valve as far as that's concerned. Hmm. Okay, um, I guess that is one way to look at it. Um, I guess I'm, I'm voicing my concerns to you. I know that you uh, have direct oversight over the staff for the Heritage Preservation Commission. And so I'd like to voice my opinion then to you as the person who um, supervises that function that um, I can understand that, you know, and maybe in the downtown, you know, to hide um, solar arrays that might be on the tops of structures, but for other residential homes, there aren't those flat opportunities, you know, for for rooftops to be able to hide um, solar arrays and such. And so, um, I would uh, greatly appreciate it if staff interpreted that with latitude to allow for um, people to be able to take advantage of new technology in these historic areas. Council Member, I will note that and pass that along. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Council Member Fulch. Council Member Lund. Thank you, Your Honor. I think while well, there's value in leaving it open so that it can be reviewed on a case by case basis, referencing a, a governing body or, a, or a, um, um, a, a, another body, but not specifically. Um, any um, ordinance or, or whatever that may or may not change over time, especially something like this where it's ever evolving, um, you know, we'd have to be going back and forth and on all these all the time. But um, also we have to be careful not to dilute what historical means because then pretty much then it's not historic Hastings and we can just wipe that, wipe that off the signs too. But um, I understand what you're saying, but I think it's important to maintain that. Um, question on the um, glare. You had mentioned that. Um, I saw that that's called out on, on the tops of buildings, but also um, on the, uh, the ground-mounted version. Um, there's not a lot of opportunities, like you said, in town but those that are surrounded by homes and streets and, and all that kind of stuff, um, what what does that actually look like? What are what are what is acceptable glare and how do we define that? Because 
the angle at which those are pointing up, I could see the homes on the hill above just be staring at glare constantly, and it would render it moot. Sure. And council member, as part of the application process, a uh, building permit, uh, we would have a glare information required. So there'd be manufacturer specifications as far as how much glare would be received depending on, on where it's located, at the angle of pitch and so forth. So we would review that against where it would be put on the site and, and make some determinations based on that. With newer products that have come out, there seems to be much less glare mm -hmm. than there has been in the past. I, I, you, I, you know, like there's a set of solar panels uh, in town here that I noticed a lot when I go by them, it's a larger array, but uh, it's of a different uh, vintage that uh, would be something we would not be allowing under this uh, code because of the amount of glare. Thank you, Councilmember Lund. Any other discussion, Council? Then I would accept a motion to approve an ordinance of the City of Hastings, Minnesota, amending Hastings City Code Chapter 155, Zoning Ordinance Regarding Solar Energy Systems. So moved. I'll second. Council Member Fox, second by Council Member Fulch. New discussion, Council. All those in favor of the motion state by saying aye. 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 Opposed to that motion state by saying nay. And that motion prevails. Thanks, John. Thank you. Tonight under administration, we have Community Investment Fund. And this introduction will be our city administrator, Dan Waticha. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the other day or, or last week when we were going over what was on the council agenda, I said this is going to be a fun meeting. It was because of this item. Um, uh, last year, the city budgeted for and created this new community investment fund, which is intended to um, hear from community organizations about what are some potential projects that they might think are important that might not have been on our radar or might have been on our radar a couple years down the road and, and the, uh, our, our residents, our, our organizations feel should be sooner. Um, it, so it's really a chance to have partnership between the city and organizations. And uh, we had some great projects uh, awarded last year. Some of those were finished. Some of them are wrapping up yet. Uh, they've got about an 18-month timeline to do their work. Um, anyways, uh, continued it again this year, 2023. Um, budgeted $100,000. Uh, we are recommending seven projects for approval, uh, which is about $72,000 of that, $73,000 of that. <clears throat> So there's about $27,000 unspoken for if, if this is uh, approved tonight. Um, organizations can still submit applications between now and the end of the year. Um, the, that initial deadline of March 31st is just so that we don't fund the first project that comes in the door and then we miss the next one. So uh, really this just tries to even the, the playing field, it's, it's open for the rest of the year. And the intent is if monies aren't used, we would carry those forward in the community investment fund in future years. So there's no obligation to spend it. Anyways, that, that's way for background. Um, noted we had eight applications. Uh, one was not recommended for approval. It uh, was not on city property, which is one of the preconditions. Uh, it also, um, uh, Besides not being on city property, the organization uh, is leasing that property and is already in year two of a three-year lease. So there was concerns about what are the long-term prospects of this. Um, it may be something that they can revisit and look at other ways to, to work that project in the future, but um, seven of the eight applications were recommended for approval. Uh, one, uh, the Downtown Business Association for uh, holiday lighting in the downtown area. Uh, second is uh, BR4R, Building Remembrance for Reconciliation, uh, to do additional uh, planning and design work for a future uh, commemorative art project installation. Uh, the third one is uh, combined uh, Dakota County Historic Society and the, the Leduc uh, Mansion. Um, I think it's Leduc Historic Estate. Uh, any, anyways, um, 
is uh, they came to us about a month ago and gave a presentation that really cool. We as a community are getting back boxes of original furnishings from the, the Leduc home that have been in storage up in St. Paul and uh, they're trying to make room in their storage and said, do you want this cool stuff back? So uh, happy to take that, uh, but it creates some storage needs for the Leduc. Uh, so uh, their request is for uh, some shelving and archival supplies for that materials coming back. Obviously, some of the will be displayed uh, permanently. Some of it may be more rotating basis, uh, but happy to have those materials uh, able to come back. Uh, their, their application also is uh, uh, for repairing the roof on the chicken coop. Uh, the, the chickens are a popular portion of the, uh, the, the, the tours that go through, especially with the kiddos. Uh, Hastings Football Soccer Club um, is interested in doing um, core, core aeration and top dressing projects for the, the soccer fields out at, at uh, the Vets Athletic Complex. Uh, this is something that <clears throat> new this year, uh, the city budgeted to uh, purchase uh, the, the, the equipment for doing this. Um, uh, beyond that, it, it also takes materials, um, but the, the, uh, the community investment fund piece lets us do additional. So instead of saying the city's going to begin um, aerating uh, and top dressing and maybe we can do three fields during this year uh, Hastings Football Club coming forward with this application would let us do additional fields beyond the, the three that we might might have done this year so it lets us go further uh, get caught caught up with our fields sooner uh, until we get into more of a maintenance basis in the future uh, the last project uh, Hastings environmental protectors HEP uh, submitted three applications that were found interesting. Uh, one is uh, a really neat trial project. It is uh, to install a pair of floating bio islands at the uh, detention pond at Cary Park. Um, these essentially are a, sort of a floating plastic platform uh, that gets planted with um, aquatic vegetation. So. Uh, you don't see the plastic, you can see the vegetation, but the more important part is if you look underwater, there's two or three feet worth of roots that go down below this floating island and into the water and help filter out phosphorus and other pollutants in the water and, and um, uh, make for a, a better uh, aquatic habitat. It's new to us. Uh, it reached out to our engineers. Hey, have you heard of this? Do these work? We don't know, but what a cool thing to try, and, and if it works out great, uh, we'll, we'll uh, probably expand it to some other uh, ponds that we have in town that, that have some stagnant water. Uh, their other application, or their second one, was um, to rent uh, uh, some sculptures uh, to place in Vermilion Linear Park near the, the trail, uh, help draw attention to the, the park and the... the um, Habitat uh, maintenance in the park um, brings some visual interest and art appreciation to the trail system. Uh, we did ask the Arts and Culture Commission to weigh in on this. Uh, they certainly were supportive. They had some comments about um, as it comes forward, they, they would like to have some thoughts on uh, where it might be located or uh, questions about making sure that there were liability concerns addressed or uh, ADA concerns so that uh, 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 people that maybe are less mobile are still able to see and enjoy these. Uh, so appreciate their, their comments. Anyways, it's uh, three sculptures, one a year for three years. So one would rotate in for a year and then a year later a different one would rotate in in its place. So. Uh, a nice ongoing commitment there. Uh, their third application, which is also recommended, is uh, to have some uh, professionally done educational um, signage about pollinator habitat. So uh, they, there's several areas in town that they have um, volunteered and invested in having 
milkweed and echinacea and various plants that uh, butterflies and songbirds might inhabit and, and help uh, pollinate. Um, let's bring an educational piece to it so people don't think it's just a weedy patch. They, they know what it's for uh, and maybe even some identification of specific uh, plants and, and butterflies that might be visiting there. Um, in total, these recommendations are $72,600 and change. Uh, the Finance Committee met uh, on April 25th, uh, and Arts and Culture Commission, that's a typo, maybe April 5th. Um, and the uh, Arts and Culture Commission met April 12th, uh, supporting the, the HEP project. But with that, I can take any questions. Uh, really looking forward to some, some great partnerships and, and projects moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Councilmember Lund. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Dan, thanks for all that. I think it's great. Um, one of the things that I, I don't want to be left unsaid or left um, un underlined is the matching. It's really a super key component to this, and, and the main one of the main reasons why I was really excited about it when we did this in last year. Um, Seventy-two thousand six hundred and seventy-five dollars and seventy-five cents is being requested of the fund today, but forty-two thousand nine hundred and four dollars and seventy-five cents has been um, raised in in matching from private citizens. So it's you know. Uh, um, $115,000 um, benefit, net benefit. Last year we did better. Maybe it was because it was the first year we had all the good ideas then, but um, uh, 96977 is what we approved, and the match was $94,404, almost $200,000 from a $100,000 investment. Um, so I think that's huge because um, it's a great way to get for for charitable organizations or, or other organizations to be able to um, raise the awareness and the excitement about it and 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 really um, encourage people to, to give because it is a matched because um, there's there can be a match to it. Um, so I hope that we can get uh, back up to that ninety six ninety four, Dan, but. Um, you know, maybe send out an email or something. I don't know. But anyway, I think that's a great, great component. I just want to make sure we highlight it. Thank you, Councilmember Lund. Additional time, Councilmember Fulch. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I wanted to add uh, my comments to, um, in addition to what Councilmember Lund uh, just said, because I think we're all thrilled about uh, the the match that has come in. It's about uh, for every dollar that we're spending. The community in this go round is spending 60 cents in match. That's one way to look at it. And uh, and last year we had wonderful projects that uh, came forward, and we're super excited to see those being implemented. Uh, one of which was the scoreboard at the um, Hastings Ice Rink. And I'm sure there, you're all tired of listening to me uh, beg for that project. And so it's great to see that new scoreboard that's up there. Um, one thing, uh, the one project that Dan had uh, mentioned uh, that didn't get funded, it was actually a proposal that came from our Hastings YMCA. And uh, an initiative that they're trying to undertake is to create additional fields adjacent to the Y. Um, it's actually a lina that owns the land next to the Y. And they have um, currently a three-year lease agreement with the YMCA to develop what had been community gardens there, if you remember. You've seen folks farming on it, um, to convert that into field space. And um, so I, uh, so the three of us who were on the finance uh, committee of the council were uh, fully in agreement that uh, that project, as it was presented, did not meet the minimum requirements uh, for uh, the community investment funds, which were that it had to be on public land. And so because it was on a line of land, it didn't meet that uh, that requirement. And so I uh, called uh, the executive director of our, our Hastings YMCA, Josh Schof, uh, to have this conversation with him so that he understood why it is that we had to reject it. Um, not that we were rejecting the why because they're a great community partner, but it just didn't meet the parameters of this. Um, and, and just so the whole council you know, is aware that, um, so that within the uh, 
coming forward will be the Parks and Recreation five-year plan. And a part of that was um, a suggestion in there that we take the Featherstone uh, Park that's across the street from the YMCA and perhaps allow that to go back into being natural habitat, you know, of a, of a ponding basin. And so I had uh, discussed that also with Josh so that he was aware of it. And um, he also, um, as I was, I was uh, concerned about this lease arrangement with Alina, how long term that was going to be, what would be the ramifications if the city no longer maintained the Featherstone uh, Ponding Basin. Um, and so for us to, you know, to think, you know, how is it that we could move in a partnership with the YMCA um, to uh, make sure that uh, we're expanding, you know, the ability, you know, for our community to enjoy recreational activities, be it, you know, on a private parcel that the Y is developing or, you know, across from uh, the Y at the Featherstone uh, Ponding Basin. And so he uh, reached out and sent us all an email, you know, requesting that we be mindful of, you know, them wanting to continue this partnership and how is it that could we could possibly make this work into the future with being supportive of expanding um, sporting fields uh, next to the Y there. So I just wanted to mention that to everybody so we're all on the same page as we're thinking about this uh, moving forward. So uh, enough of that. Um, and so uh, thanks again to all the community partners who are out there and who have been helping to make this uh, positive program for our, um, all of us in the end. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Fulch. Okay, Council, I would accept a motion to approve the community investment fund projects as outlined in our staff memo. So moved. Council Member Pimble and Council Member Fulch is second. New discussion, Council? All those in favor of the motion state by saying aye. 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 Opposed to that motion state by saying nay. And that motion pre prevails. Uh, number two under administration would be the number six gambling um, fees that were was pulled from the agenda by Council Member Lund. Would you like to start it out? Sure, thanks. Uh, I pulled it. Um, I think um, during public comments we had some great we had some great. Um, comments and, and, and um, insight and I'd like to open up a conversation effectively um, to understand what the members of the committee um, had in mind um, for the, the, the changes and um, maybe background on the initial reason for the changes to begin with. Um, I'd also like to understand um, what uh, you know where we stand compared to surrounding cities from a percentage of funds allocated within the city's trade boundaries I believe is the term um, and precedence for kind of the fee structure of that 10 percent um, and uh, also what are the reasons for needing to charge a 10% fee? What, what costs are the city, is the city incurring by um, allowing these operations that we're not currently recouping? Thank you, Council Member Lund. Council Member Fulch. Um, thank you, Your Honor. I um, too had some concerns. I mean, obviously we don't want to be harming our current organizations that were, are here in Hastings. Um, I was curious about a statement um, that Ray had made um, from the, the Legion about how um, that the Hastings Veterans Home wouldn't technically qualify as a um, charitable, as a as an organization that could receive a charitable donation because it's technically a part of the state of Minnesota rather than the, without, rather than being within the trade, area. Yeah, the trade area. Thank you. It's like, how about all that work? And so um, I guess my, my question would be um, to our city attorney, Corey Land, um, as to, you know, what her interpretation is of how the ordinance is uh, currently presented as if, if you've, feel would that the way that it's currently worded would that be a problem or could we modify the language 
to say something to the effect that, um, you know, so that we can, you know, perhaps add a little language that says, um, you know, that within, you know, the taxable area, you know, or, um, or you know, or just blatantly say that Hastings, you know, Veterans Home, right? You know, to add that on so that um, that doesn't preclude the the Legion from being able to, you know, raise money and, and donate donate that because it's still obviously within our own community. Thanks. If I may, Your Honor, uh, members of the council, that I was actually thinking that same question as he was um, articulating that he didn't think it would qualify under this definition, and I. We're not the IRS, so we're not looking at where you wrote the check to. I think the bottom line is we look at where the money is spent. And so if you, as long as the organization could show that maybe you wrote the check to the state of Minnesota, the vet's home, but that it actually was allocated for the one in Hastings or for a, a, a member that's in Hastings, that would be sufficient. We're not going to dive any deeper than that. We don't need to know names. We would trust that if you have a specific fund that is designated for all of the Hastings allocations, that would satisfy the need uh, to, to be used, whether it be Hastings or, or one of the contiguous communities as well. They would qualify as well. It doesn't have to be literally within the city of Hastings. But we can take a broader um, interpretation. We're not going to, again, look at exactly where the check was written and take that as gospel. If, as long as you can show good faith effort that we specifically gave this donation for the trade area in Hastings, that would qualify. Am I supposed to go over here and have something? Can I say anything? You can't. Well, you can, but Dan, would you like to speak first? Yeah, I, 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 there's a, certainly a number of questions, but there were three or four questions raised at the start of the council's discussion that just gets skipped over. Um, uh, briefly, sort of a question at why this proposed change. Um, really, I think it's a matter of wanting to make sure that we keep money raised in Hastings and adjacent in Hastings, and, or keep money raised in Hastings in Hastings and the adjacent trade area. Um, uh, we have uh, several uh, licensed organizations, not questioning them at all or the work that they do, but located outside of Hastings. Um, uh, we have uh, not quite just the, the trade area question, but sort of tightening up and making sure that we're keeping Hastings money in Hastings. Uh, we have an organization that did, has not submitted uh, uh, reports for five or six years until we asked around to see, make sure we knew where pull tabs were didn't know this organization was still doing lawful gambling in Hastings or whether or not they're spending currently 50% in Hastings. Uh, so sort of the reason why, a matter of if money's coming from Hastings, we want it to stay here. We don't want it going up to Maple Grove or other places out, out, out of town, uh, at least most of it. Um, I'm sure there's more nuances to that, but I think that's the gist of it. Uh, there was a question, how do we compare to other cities? Um, we do have uh, a listing. Uh, it's, it varies from 0% to 100%. Uh, so uh, Bloomington, 30%. Blaine, 100%. Brooklyn Park, 75 Burnsville, 0 Coon Rapids, 60 Duluth, 60 Egan, 60 Eden Prairie, 30 Edina, 0 Maple Grove, 75, Minneapolis, 80, Plymouth, 75, Richfield, 0, Rochester, 95%, St. Louis Park, 90%, St. Paul, 0, surprised by that one, uh, Woodbury, 80%, Cottage Grove, 50%, uh, Elk River, 75, Golden Valley, looks like a 10, White Bear Lake, 50, Shoreview, uh, 100%. 100%. So it varies. Um, some some don't charge it at all or don't have any designation to, to a trade area, and some say 100% and in between. We're at 50% currently. Um, the question about costs to the city for the 10%, I think, is a misinterpretation of what that charitable contribution fund is. Um, 
the cost of the city, uh, basically some staff time to file, receive the paperwork, verify it, that's covered by the $150 renewal fee. Uh, the 10% uh, really would go to a um, designated fund managed by the city, we'll have to figure it in the budget process how, how we might use it, uh, for um, purposes that are allowed under state statute. So for example, uh, we might use it to uh, make contributions or to, to help fund and budget our community investment fund project. The last couple of years we've said $100,000 out of savings and we've not determined an ongoing revenue source for it. We've just taken one-time money. If this raises thirty-five dollars to $50,000 a year, maybe it's a funding source for the community investment fund, or at least half of it. Uh, potentially um, looking at what some of those other cities use their funds for, they use it for park improvements, which we had on a much bigger scale, a workshop just a week ago or two weeks ago about how difficult it is to find revenue sources for our park system and upgrading um, uh, playgrounds and equipment and how do we find other funds and diversify our funds. Um, other cities use it for buying police cars and fire trucks and I think thirty-five dollars to $50,000 probably doesn't get you a fire truck, but um, it's certainly revenue to, to other uses. So those are a few examples, um, but it's, it's not going to be used to um, fill potholes. It's not just going to be used to uh, you know, be a plug in our budget. It would be used for specifically identified projects during the budget process. But it's not, it's not a uh, offset city cost. It really it's looking at uh, eligible expenditures under state law. Um, that answered questions, Council Member? Thanks. Okay, thank you, Dan. Kelly, you had something to add? Thank you, Mayor. Just one quick comment about the 75%. So the, the increase from 50 to 75% is 75% in the trade area. Uh, the 10% contribution to the charitable, the charitable fund is not on top of the 75%. So I want to make sure that that was clear. We've had some calls from folks today who've been clarifying that. So it would be essentially 65% in the trade area plus the 10%. So that counts toward that total 75%. I'm confused at that. It, the 10%, is that on our, what our revenue would be? If, say if we took in $700,000 in one year, you're going to tax us 10% and get $70,000. It's a lot more than the $35,000 that, that he was speaking about. I, I, I guess I'm, where's that 10% going? Where's it coming from? The net, the net it, it seems like it's two separate things. You're telling us that we can only spend the 75% of our money in Hastings, and then we're going to take 10% more from you. Excuse me, Ken. To go into that fund. Will you state your name, Kevin? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm Chris Anderson. I'm the commander at the American Legion Post here in Hastings. Thank you. And if that 10% comes off of our top line, we can't make improvements to our posts. A lot of that money, we, some of that money that we have that the state doesn't take, we use for improvements. So you take that 10, additional 10%, we don't have that money to do that. It's 10% it's off the net. It's off your bottom line. It's still 10%. It's, it's very different. We had $700,000 last year in gambling revenue. Here in Hastings? Yes. We did. Our post. And I, <clears throat> my name is Ray Cannon once again. I'd like to make a, a comment, too, because the 10%, you, you know, I know you guys, it's 10% to the community. I understand that. that It's amazing. But right now, we're, we're debating House File 1938. Um, they're talking about a deduction it's not here. for E-tabs and stop putting the all feature on there, that's going to be a deduction in our revenue at least 25%, and that's, that's a minimum number. We're projecting, most of us, Allied Charities, protect our charities, we're projecting at least 40% in revenue deduction with that. And then we were expecting, we're fighting for every dollar that we get, and we're, we're expecting to get, if you're at the higher tax revenue of 36%, to get at least 31%, and that was just amended to 34%. So if this goes through, we're gonna, it's going to be devastating to our communities. And not only our communities, but our, our legions across the state, but also in Hastings. We talk about our community. The Hastings veterans or the Hastings Legion need some improvements. 
And every dollar that we're taking out of our fund is going to be a dollar hurting for veterans. But not only that, 36%. I'm paying $46,000 minimum, and I'm a small organization, on taxes a month to the state of Minnesota. Then you're going to add 10% onto that. And then onto that, if this goes through the Senate, we're going to get a deduction of at least 25, 30% of our revenue. That's going to hurt us. That's going to hurt us really bad. And that's why we're concerned about this, adding another 10%. That's 46% of our revenue is going to go out to other organizations. And then we're taxing on 75% or 65% now to the city of Hastings. That means the VA Veterans Hospital, the Legionville, where Legionville is where we have a safety program where we educate um, schools on crosswalks and safety, bus exiting, emergency facilities. And then you're talking about Boy State, Girl State. I can sit here and last for all talk about all the programs that just the Legion invests in. Minnesota Veterans Assistance Fund. That fund is given across the state and it's used by gambling money. But that fund is not something that's in the trade area here. It's through the state of Minnesota, American Legion Department of Minnesota. But I will tell you right now, I looked it up. As soon as we get this on Friday, and if I was maybe got it a little earlier, I'd have a presentation. But I looked it up, $15,000 that we used just this year for veterans in the Hastings area. And part of that money that the, the Legion donates through their organization here in Hastings went to that fund. We have to make sure that we're, we're and I know we're, we're fighting for everything we get. The veterans in Minneapolis, homes, and the Hastings homes and homes across the state need those mo that money to continue their, their fight for veterans. And the additional money going to Hastings here, it's going to hurt and it's going to devastate. It's, it's, it's going to devastate what we're doing here in Hastings, the American Legion for programming. Another additional 10%, like I said, it sounds 10% doesn't seem like it's a lot, but it is. Right now, we're having a press conference, and I can talk, I know you guys, it's all about the Senate stuff, but this right here, another 10%, that's 10% of programs throughout the state that we're not going to be able to donate to because we have to put it towards the community here. And some of the athletic associations across in this area, they're awesome because they're donating to the kids here and the community, and that's great because it stays in Hastings. We give a lot of money to the Hastings organizations here, but once again, I don't think it's going to hit 65%. And if we give it an additional 10%, and we just got ETABs here at Hastings. So we're doing everything we can do to try to increase our revenue to make sure that Legion stays open. Our Legions are under fire through the state. An additional 10%, once again, it's going to hurt us. Very bad. Bad. Devastating for programs that we have. Homelessness, veterans that are homeless. I can tell you right now, just off my hand, five. I provided for Beyond the Yellow Ribbon that I get money from Legions, St. Paul Park Legion, the Hastings Legion, the Hastings or the, the uh, Cottage Grove VFW, all in this area. That money is not coming from, with all due respect, not coming from Hastings. The only part right now that I get a donation from is the Hastings Legion. There's 3M, all the money that I generate for you beyond the Yellow Ribbon is being generated in St. Paul Park, Newport, and Cottage Grove that's coming to Hastings. We spent 158, we had 158 soldiers, families that we took care of for Christmas. 20 of those families were from Hastings. That money came from the Hastings American Legion Post, but it wasn't donated to the Hastings area. And that's the check why wasn't written. It wasn't written to the Hastings yeah. Our members do a fantastic job of keeping the money in, in the city of Hastings. If I get something from somewhere else, it gets 86th because we want to stay, keep our money here, help our veterans here and slightly, slightly across the river. Um, we, we also support the American Legion baseball team. We're trying to get a softball team started. That's going to take money away from that. We just gave four thousand dollars to the baseball team um, that we wouldn't be able to because to to pay two of their coaches, they come every year and we we give them that four thousand dollars so they can pay those coaches for the baseball teams. Without the money, that they wouldn't have those teams. 
We're also supporting um, just all in the area south of here, the small little towns, Hampton, places like that. So it's just not, it's, to, it's in Dakota County roughly, but our, my, I know our members, when they hear something that's northern Minnesota, eh, a vote to decline because we want to keep our money here. And the Hastings home is very near and dear to us. It's very important that we can be able to give them as much as we can. And everybody that's been into the American Legion and walked into the bathrooms there, they're not ADA compliant. We're working on trying to find uh, architects to, to change that here in the next couple of years to make some improvements. If we don't have that money, we can't make it. So they're going to have to stay the way they're at. But we would prefer to do something to improve that because I go through different American legions throughout the state and I'm jealous of their buildings. They're wonderful. They're huge. They're great. But I'm never jealous of the location. <laughs> never. We have, I think we have the best location of any legion in the state of Minnesota. We have people coming from Blaine. I was talking to a guy. He said, yeah, we just come down on a Saturday morning and have breakfast because we like to watch the boats. So it is, it, we do draw money from out, and they're gamblers too. But uh, that 10% would just kill us. So. Thank you, Mr. Anderson and Mr. Thank you. Dean. Uh, Council Member Pemble. I'm looking at this and saying, okay, when I first heard about this and asked when was the ordinance last reviewed, and it's been... 2008? 2008. Now, to do your due diligence as council folks up here, we have to be considerate of where money comes from, how the ordinances are written, and review them appropriately and keep them up to speed. And that's, that's basically how this ordinance review started out. And then looking at what our neighbors in the metro area are are doing and what we're not doing and that's how a lot of this information move forward into this change for the the ordinance on gambling and so I think that you know you're I, I so certainly hear what's being said but we as the elected representatives of the community of Hastings have an obligation to make sure that we keep ourselves financially on par, basically, so that we're not in trouble and we don't end up having big issues of raising taxes in order to pay for these things. And so part of that comes from costs that are endured through different programs that are used throughout the city. And so that's how this got started in, you know, Ordinances, just like anything else, they need review. Probably not, you know, from 2008, we kind of dropped the ball. They should be reviewed every couple years to make sure we're in par. And that's what I'd like to say is that, you know, nobody up here went and said, no, we're going to change this because it, it's, it's an issue. No, it's not an issue. We just want to bring ourselves to the point where we are compatible with the neighbors around us. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Councilmember Pimmel. Councilmember Lund. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, hopefully, hopefully this will be easy enough math, but could you please break down what the overall recommendation would be if an organization had $100,000 of funds? So what would that 75 and 10 net out to be because I think there's a little bit of a confusion on the math as well at least from this guy right here can I ask for two weeks I, I, I really I'd rather before putting math and numbers out there I'd rather make sure that they're right and and accurate can even give real numbers from organizations instead of a hypothetical I'm, hypothetical. but I'm, I, I don't want to just Yep. Yeah. Wing it. I'd rather make sure they're right. Can we bring it to the next council meeting? Yeah. I'm. I mean, I'm. I'm one step away from recommending we table this for for a bit anyway. Um, not that there's 
I mean, I just think there's a lot of great conversation, and sometimes you just can't get it done in a, in a in one sitting. Okay. Um, it sounds as though we are among the people that are doing the right stuff, and there's other groups that are not. Maybe, and we're the and it's the case where the good guys are suffering a little bit because of some of people that aren't maybe doing their due diligence. Um, I think it is important to try to keep a, a, a significant portion of the funds raised within the community for the same reason why I'm not really a big fan of the 10%. Uh, here's why. I think if I am not, a, I'm not really a gambler, um, but if I were to be one, um, and I saw that, you know, when I'm going and I'm spending my money at the pull tabs or, or whatever it is, that this goes towards X, Y, Z. I guess it would be a little bit confusing to me that it, there's an asterisk by that. Um, what 10% doesn't. Um, and then, you know, depending on what city you're at, it might not even go anywhere in your community. So, you know, I think they both need to be weighed out a little bit, right? Um, is there a magic percent? No, there's not. A lot of times we have to, it, it seems arbitrary, but um, sometimes we have to pick what seems to be a reasonable percent of something, whether it's this issue or others. Um, and you can pick it apart a million different ways. As you can see by the laundry list of percentages that Dan read, every city picked a different number out of the air. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm fine with looking at the 75 or some sort of increase from 50. Um, I think that maybe the, the, the qualifications for that maybe need to be reviewed a little bit more and cleared up so that organizations that are trying to do the right thing aren't, can, you know, um, put in a bad spot. Um, but I, I would like more conversation, but I would ask that we um, table this for at least two weeks. I don't really care um, as long as we have enough time, Dan, to, to gather the right information. I don't want to put undue you know, stress on it if two weeks isn't enough, but um, I would ask that and um, you know, look at you know, the rationale for the 10% the as well. Thank you, Councilmember Lund. Councilmember Lightfield. Thank you, Honor. I have a few questions, Dan. First off, you made a comment earlier when talking about the 75% is based on their overall, what's the, what do we call it? Based on at, their, their, their net, based on net. So, I mean, math is math. Um, $700,000, if that's your net, 75% of that is 525,000. 10% of that 525,000 would be $70,000. It's not an additional 70,000 on top of the 525. So I'm looking at 700, just a number, $700,000 raised in the city of Hastings as a net. 75% of that is $525,000. Next question, what is, trade area what is the definition of our trade area I want him to yeah is it, is it for me oh, yes okay. just checking um, your honor members of the council the trade area is defined by state law as being all contiguous communities to the city of Hastings so we're in the city of Hastings it's us and all of their contiguous immediately contiguous communities okay which in Contiguous state. in the state of Minnesota. In the state, yes. Okay. Then, Dan, or Kelly, I'm not sure who's got this report in front of them. The city of Cottage Grove, Newport, and St. Paul Park. Are they on your list? Cottage Grove is 50%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Newport? Do not have Newport. Or St. Paul? Oh, Park was the other one. I don't have those, but I can look them up. And on that 50% of Cottage Grove, is any of that to a charitable 
Okay, because we do have communities that have that. When Dan was giving percentages to us earlier, mm -hmm. there is also many communities that have a percentage that goes to the city. Okay, that have both. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Fox. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I just as a point of clarification, um, if we approve this for or consider this first reading and approve it we can still receive further information and amend it in the next reading yes okay so we can wait for two weeks i appreciate that time frame and get more information about all of the the data that we've requested and come back and still clarify some of the residency regulations or um, some of those organizational regulations that um, we have asked for thank you council member lund and um still honor the work that the administrative committee has done to get us to this point because it, i i personally believe it it is important to keep our ordinances up to date um, and to review them as we recommend doing um, in this way um, perhaps we're not right on the money at this point no pun intended but um we at least have to talk about it. So I think if we get more information, we can approve the first reading and move forward and still amend what is to come. Okay. Correct. Okay. Thank right. you. Council Member Fultz. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'd like to make a request of Ms. Land uh, for the next uh, meeting you know something that makes me super nervous about those second readings is that we don't do so well as a council making amendments to ordinances on the fly and we just stink at it because we haven't had the opportunity to think it through right you know and we and that's kind of your last at bat is the second reading and so that just seems like a, a bad time to be you know making last second amendments and so i would I would like to ask if um, Ms. Land could uh, prepare an amendment as an option on the side um, to delete the 10% provision, um, and then we could have that wording available so that we could have further conversation and we could ask for the amendment at that time to be um, considered and voted upon. If I think that that would be a a good contingency plan if we're going to move forward with the first reading today and then we'll act on it because I'm just you know like Robert's rules of order and how it is we're supposed to go about doing all of this stuff is that this is supposed to be a first reading and we're not supposed to be taking action on it or we can't take action on it right we just have to go through the first reading and then it's in the second reading where you take action on it just for clarification for y'all who have come tonight so that you understand how this all works procedurally because it takes a while to get used to it so right all right, okay, so that's my request for the amendment in the next meeting, and then we can take action. Sure. Thank, okay. you. Thank you, Council Member Fulch, Council Member La Pemble. Yes, there's a motion to table on the agenda, and I second that, so let's have that one. Was that stated in the his motion? I requested that we table. Okay, that's your motion. Seconded by Councilmember Pemble. Additional discussion, Council. All those in favor. Hold on. So, just to confirm, Your Honor, based on what's just been said, if we were to. That was not stated in a motion. Thank you. Yeah. Based on what was stated as conversation by Councilmember Fulch and Attorney Lands, if we were to vote no to this amendment, that brings back the initial first reading. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. There's a motion on the table. Additional discussion, Council Member Fox. I just, just to clarify, point of clarification again, if we table it, it becomes the first reading again. Yes. It is not gonna be the second reading. Correct. Okay, thank you. Just making sure. Okay. Additional discussion, Council. There's a motion on the table. There's a motion to table. All those in favor of that motion to table, state by saying aye. 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 
Opposed to that motion, state by saying nay. Nay. Did you get that, clerk? Maybe we should do a call? Yeah. We'll do a roll call. Councilmember Pemble. Yes. Councilmember Lund. Yes. Councilmember Leifeld. Nay. Councilmember House. Nay. Councilmember Fulch. Nay. Councilmember Fox. Nay. Mayor Fassbender. Yes. So we are at Your a. Honor, I would like to make a motion. Reading. First reading. I would like to make a motion, Your Honor, to Council approve. Member the, I would like to make a motion to approve the first reading as stated. Second. There is a motion and a second on the table. Discussion, Council. All those in favor of the motion on the table, state by saying aye. 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 Opposed to that motion, state by saying nay. And that motion prevails. So we have first reading has been done. Second reading will be in two weeks with more information, more discussion. We do appreciate you coming. And, and like I told you at the beginning of the meeting, this is a time to do that. And we will be able to act and talk and have more discussion on it the second reading. So thank you. And we do appreciate everything you do within our community. Okay, Council, any announcements? Council Member Fulch. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I just wanted to give a quick update, a little follow-up from uh, our last Council meeting where we talked about the no-wake uh, request. And so I have uh, had the opportunity to speak with uh, Sheriff Joe Lecko, the last uh, uh, week and he has just been really wonderful uh, to have conversations with about this. And so um, he did say that uh, the Sheriff's Office, the Dakota County Sheriff's Office did do some data gathering about where they were monitoring uh, the public access points and you know how much uh, traffic that they were seeing. And uh, so they are going to forward that information to us. And so they were still interested in working with <laughs> the city on exploring uh, the no wake uh, zone request. And so I had asked him if we could have a small group, you know, stakeholders meeting uh, so that the uh, sheriff's office could uh, hear, you know, from those uh, businesses and residents that are affected by uh, the river. And so uh, he had agreed to that and he had checked with uh, our chief uh, Wilski. And so we're looking at uh, next Wednesday, uh, April the 26th and having that conversation at 6 p.m. And I was gonna request if we could have it here in the volunteer room or another room here within city hall. And so um, more to come on that. And so thank you uh, to uh, Sheriff Lucko for that. Um, and then secondly, the uh, second piece was um, they had offered as uh, Chief Wolski had said, to uh, look at doing a no wake zone during uh, when there's flood waters um, at um, on hand. And so I talked to him this afternoon about that and I told him how bad it was on the St. Croix. I just saw it just this morning. They are, downtown Hudson was um, beginning to flood in their in their rear parking and such. And so he had said uh, that the St. Croix is currently at a no wake uh, uh, zone status. And so he is tomorrow going to enact a 30 day temporary no wake zone on um, here in Hastings along the riverfront. So that uh, to protect our, our marinas and our residential area along um, the river. And so he said that they'll be doing a press release tomorrow and that they'll be uh, putting up signs at the public access points. And so I'm very thankful for his cooperation in, in helping our, our citizens and our businesses with this matter. That was my update. Oh, and I have one other thing I just wanted to bring up since we were talking about solar energy and um, specific to, you know, electric vehicles, um, just uh, to let folks know that Excel Energy is currently 
uh, they are looking to do installations of EV charging stations. Uh, they stopped there. They had a, a grant program. It was called the Make Ready Program, where they were helping to pay for infrastructure costs for EV charging stations. And they have uh, closed that pro that uh, program down. And now they're looking at doing their own installations. And so I just wanted to bring that up to city staff. I know that um, one of the Excel Energy folks that has been um, had approached the city of Red Wing was uh, Ross Lexvold. He's the community relations and economic development manager there, and I think that there's a there is an Excel Energy employee that's designated for Hastings that does Hastings outreach, which you're probably aware of, and so you may want to touch base with them and to see if they would be interested. You know, and um, since the uh, previous vendors that were looking to do installations and work with the city have, it sounds like that they've backed out um, because of Excel Energy no longer having that Make Ready program available. Um, so uh, maybe working with Excel Energy directly and finding um, an opportunity in our downtown area uh, for a high-speed charger would be, would be something that we should be exploring. I think it would be a great opportunity. So that's it. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Councilmember Fulch. Okay, I have a few announcements. Hastings Area Earth Day Birding Festival at Carpenter Nature, St. Croix Valley Nature Center on Saturday, April 22nd. Guiding birding, guided birding trips, birding banding demonstration, and raptor presentation. Please, please register. The third annual Sound the Siren Food for Kids and Drive takes place April 17th through the 28th. The Food Drives is a friendly competitive between the City of Hastings Police Department and the Dakota County Sheriff's Office. The community is encouraged to donate kid-friendly, single-serving, non-perishable food items. When the cars are filled, the sirens will sound. Volunteer with the Hastings Parks and Recreation Department and plant a tree in celebration of Arbor Day. Our city forester will provide a demonstration prior to planting. Friday, April 28th at Gretton Park. Pre-registration appreciated. Meetings Tuesday, April 18th, 7 p.m. Heritage Preservation Commission. Wednesday, April 19th, 6 p.m. Parks and Rec Commission. Monday, April 24th, 7 p.m., Planning Commission. 7 p.m., Monday, April 24th, Public Safety Commission. Friday, 28th of April, 8 a.m., City Council Strategic Planning Retreat. And Monday, May 1st, 7 p.m., City Council Regular Meeting. I would accept a motion to adjourn. So moved, John. Council Member Leifel? And Councilmember Fox. All those in favor of the motion state by saying aye. 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 And opposed to that motion state by saying nay. And we are adjourned.